Have you seen the newest trailers for Cars 3? They're like the most intense things ever, and they're doing a great job of bringing people who may have felt left down by Cars 2 back to the series. Truly, Lightning McQueen is this generation's Rocky Balboa. I'm not too sure what to think about what I just said there. So, with a new Cars movie coming our way next month, it's once again time to talk about the incredibly strange world that Pixar has created for the purposes of this franchise. I mean, a world populated by anthropomorphic motor vehicles was of course bound to get people talking. Mostly questions like, why? And how? How does a world like this even come to be? Well, unsurprisingly, there have been many theories. But maybe a little more surprising is that most of these theories seem to be very dark and grisly and horrifying. And that's why we're here today. What's up everybody, I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and today we're going to examine a few of these theories and try to find an answer for one of the biggest questions raised about Pixar's body of work. That question being, did the cars from Cars kill all the humans? So let's start this Pixar theory with what else? The Pixar theory. Now, we've gone on about this theory before, so we're not going to spend too much time on it today. But it's worth mentioning that the Cars series has always been a bit of a question mark in the theory's timeline. By which I mean the Cars movies would have to take place at a time where there were no humans on Earth. And within several versions of the theory, there are a few explanations for this. For example, the original Pixar theory states that Cars likely takes place during the events of WALL-E, when all of humanity has left Earth. While another theory that's risen in popularity lately is that the Cars are actually a highly evolved form of insect, which would place the movies well past most of the other movies in the Pixar timeline, because, you know, most of the Pixar movies have humans in them and evolution takes like a really long time. Now when it comes to the Pixar theory, we're gonna be approaching this from a bit of a different perspective, so let's for today put that thought experiment aside. For the most part, anyway. As for the insect theory, while it's a really interesting idea, it doesn't really wrap everything up with a nice little bow. Which is totally reasonable because it's almost impossible to do that with any theory. The theory states that the cars are the way they are because they've evolved for so long past the time of humans that they've become their own dominant organism. This implies that the movies take place millions of years since the time of humans, which would pretty much make it impossible for them to be the perpetrators of some sort of mass human killing ritual like our theory suggests. But if this evolution theory is the case, then how come so many aspects of human society are omnipresent in the universe of cars? Almost everything in their world seems to be a remnant of the human's time on Earth. And I'm I'm not talking about like the societal structure or anything like that. Okay, actually I am, but I'm also talking about the small things. In the extended trailer for Cars 3 alone, we can see things like spray bottles on shelves and cameras being used by reporters. Our technology isn't really made to last five to eight million years, which I'm using as a point of reference because that's roughly how long it took for humans to evolve. So why are we seeing devices clearly made for human hands in the movie? The cameras the reporters use even have grips made for, you know, gripping by human hands, which I'm sure I don't need to remind you, cars do not have. So what practical purpose would these designs have if they were never made with humans in mind? It's like if you were abducted by aliens that were like amorphous liquid amoebas, but they had things on their ship like buttons for pressing with your human fingers, or chairs to provide their non-existent vertebrae with lumbar support. And that's not even mentioning both the written and spoken languages in the movie. Now the movie was made in English and has all of the characters speaking as such. But if this is supposed to take place millions of years after humans, wouldn't their language have changed somewhat? Heck, we have texts from 400 years ago and we barely even talk like that anymore. And I know, I know, the movie was made for public consumption so obviously they couldn't be speaking in a language that nobody understands. But then there's also the matter of the foreign languages in Cars 2 which are also completely unchanged. So the entire society of cars seems to be derivative of human culture. So how could our languages and society as it is today be preserved for so long? Unless they weren't. As there's evidence for cars taking place in the distant future, there's also just as much evidence for cars taking place in the not-so-distant future. And yes, while it's possible that there are no humans because they've been sent away on the Axiom and Wally, -E, there's some pretty disturbing stuff about cars when we look under the hood, and I swear I didn't mean to make that pun when I wrote it, but it just came out like that, so we're just gonna roll with it. The main theory we're gonna be taking a look at today is whether or not the innocent cars from this children's franchise were able to pull off some sort of Skynet-like attack, destroying all of humanity in the process. And surprisingly, there's very little evidence of a car-human war in this fun kids movie. I mean, other 
than the remnants of human society, which could mean, you know, anything. But there is another theory that takes a bunch of these ideas and then just sort of mashes them together. And as far as I can tell, it was first proposed by Jason Torchinsky on Jalopnik.com. And his theory is that the cars are humans, merged as a mixture of people and machine like one of those endings from Mass Effect 3. Also, spoilers for Mass Effect 3. Sorry about that. The theory does talk about some of the stuff we've already talked about, but it also touches on things like why the cars still have doors. And then it goes a step further to say that if there are still doors, then there must be humans around to use them. But we're not talking about regular old humans like you. We're talking about hollow shells of people, grown in a lab to serve one specific purpose and then accommodated to suit their surroundings like me. We'll link to Torchinsky's article below this video, but it basically states that starting today with the advancements of self-driving cars, a niche crowd took it way too seriously for society standards and were since alienated from densely populated areas, forced to live in remote communities that encouraged tinkering and basically just trying to make their cars more autonomous. Remote areas like, oh, I don't know, Radiator Springs? From there, some sort of cataclysmic event, most likely something biological like a plague occurred, effectively wiping out all of the humans not living in these remote areas. And because of the fallout, it made the outside world dangerous to those that don't spend a lot of time with their cars. More specifically, in their cars. To combat this, cybernetic enhancements were accelerated to pretty much just fully assimilate humans with their cars, allowing for things like ocular projection, which would explain why the car's windshields are just these giant pair of eyes instead of you know, windshields. Instead, they're these literal windows to the soul, as well as things like limb manipulation for steering and all that. The whole thing is surprisingly in depth. I actually encourage you to take a look at it after this video because it is, it's just horrifying. Eventually, instead of conventional mating, humans are artificially grown and then immediately inserted into one of these car husks to live their lives as cars. The reason we never see the car's doors open is simply because the human inside can't take the exposure to the outside world after spending so many years like this. So basically, the cars from Pixar's Cars are like the Daleks from Doctor Who. Whew, okay, that was a lot to unpack, but it's only one part of what we're talking about today. So let's break down both the AI theory and and this horrible husk theory that I just told you about. Okay, so let's start with that weird human-car hybrid theory. On the scale of horrific sci-fi dystopia, I feel like this is somehow more intense than mass human extinction. And while this theory is dark and thought-provoking, there are some issues with it. One of the biggest ones, as I see it, comes to speech. The visualization of the article mentions a microphone, which makes sense, but what it doesn't explain is the giant cartoony mouths and tongues that these cars have. Which, granted, would be a lot harder to justify. But with the dedication that went into explaining every facet of the logistics of this theory, it still remains a pretty substantial question. So basically, I'm just being harsh on the theory because of how how detailed it is, because I'm kind of a jerk. But unfortunately, outside of that, since this theory runs very heavily on assumptions, there's not much else that can be examined. But this theory would explain why human society was so well preserved for the universe of cars, because it is human society. So now let's examine our main theory that many people have suggested ever since the first movie's release. Was there some sort of AI uprising in which the cars killed all of the humans? I mean, at a surface glance, it is a pretty reasonable guess. One of the driving forces behind this theory, especially as of late, is the amount of advanced humans have made in self-driving car technology, especially over the last few years. Only seems logical to take this idea to the extreme and assume that technology will suddenly and inevitably betray us. But with our current understanding of this technology, is that progression of events even possible? In the last few years, the technology of self-driving cars has come a really long way. But we're a little far off from things like self-governing AI or, you know, the world of cars. Which also sounds like an untrustworthy car dealership. Today's self-driving cars, while they are permitted on roads, still require a human driver in case something goes wrong. But eventually, the goal is to have these cars be able to recognize and react to almost any situation effectively eliminating traffic accidents, fender benders, and all other such mishaps. Now, here we already have a problem. If the cars in the films are meant to represent this sort of technology in its final form, then we shouldn't at any point see any sort of car accident or traffic collision. 
Oh, right. But with a theory like this, that issue could be explained away with something like, well, maybe at some point there was some kind of software update that altered the programming or allowed the AI to weigh the pros and cons of crashing into something. Actually, let's talk more about those pros and cons. As self-driving cars have become more of a reality, there have been papers and essays and articles written about the possible moral objections of entrusting such a dangerous part of our everyday lives to an autonomous machine. Way more than we could even begin to cover today. But let's start our understanding with Asimov's Laws of Robotics. These were a sort of set of guidelines outlined by science fiction writer Isaac Asimov when it came to the technological inevitability of creating things like artificial intelligence. These laws were written in a way where, on paper, it sounds like these technologies would never supersede humans. They're generally read as, 1. A robot may not injure a human being or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. 2. A robot must obey the orders given it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And 3. A robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. So if the self-driving cars of cars are made with this rule in mind, then humanity should be totally safe, right? But these laws aren't exactly hard and fast rules. They're written in a way that's ambiguous enough where there are actually quite a lot of loopholes that you could conveniently write a whole bunch of science fiction stories about that end up being critically acclaimed. Things like the ambiguity of the definitions of human being and robot are two very obvious lacks of clarity in this whole thing. But even without these loopholes, there are definite problems with basing AI on empirical rules like this. Take the well-known trolley problem that's usually brought up when talking about these sort of moral issues. Picture there's a runaway trolley barreling along as it approaches a fork in the track. Five people are tied down to one track while only one person is tied to the other. There isn't enough time for the trolley to stop, but next to you is a switch that will determine which track the trolley will take. Would you leave the lever be, allowing the trolley to kill five people, or pull the lever, causing the trolley to only kill one. What's the more ethical choice here? Unsurprisingly, in most studies where this dilemma is brought up, most people end up choosing the utilitarian option, meaning the option that benefits the most people. The lives of five obviously outweighs the life of one, right? I mean, it's debatable, that's the point, but if we have to think about this practically, that makes the most sense, right? But unfortunately, moral quandaries like that rarely ever end there. And there are tons of problems like this that would be real issues for self-driving cars. Take this example courtesy of the Moral Machine website site from MIT. If a self-driving car was driving down the road and had a sudden brake failure when someone is crossing the street, is it more ethical to kill the pedestrian or swerve into a concrete blockade, killing the passenger? This, as well as most of the other scenarios presented on that website, might seem oddly specific, but they all relate to the same base problem. When, if ever, is it appropriate to allow our own technology to autonomously kill humans, even if it is in a desperate situation like any of the ones presented? This is a particularly unsettling question because it basically asks large corporations to place a numerical and empirical value on a human life. Now, I want to make it clear that I'm not here to promote fear-mongering about self-driving cars. They're an amazing technological advancement, and if we are speaking empirically, they're on average safer than most human drivers. But to speak metaphorically about the universe of cars, if no workaround is found in these moral dilemmas when developing these cars' AI, then all it could potentially take is a quick firmware update to turn those moments of desperation into open malice. After all, with any piece of technology, you can be sure that someone is going to figure out a way to compromise it. And they'll also probably find a way to make you to be able to play Doom on it. And whether that change came from a dumb human or a self-learning, self-reprogramming AI, theoretically speaking, the window would be open there. Now, of course, there are issues with this, too. I mean, they're goofy cartoon mouths still haven't been explained. But there's also one minor detail I want to bring up when it comes to the whole killing humans theory. If the cars killed the humans, it seems weird to me that they would essentially just take their place and have everything be the same otherwise. Most history books will tell you that if one group is trying to slaughter another group of people, preservation of culture isn't really at the top of the list of priorities. So did these seemingly innocent cars kill all of the humans? It's hard to say, but based on the trajectory and implication of our own technology and morals, it's definitely a possibility that we could have taught these cars to kill in the first place. But at the same time, this sort of assimilation theory also makes a disturbing amount of sense. At least, as much as most of the other theories out there. It just took the same base idea with the self-driving cars and took it in a 
wildly different direction. So with all of that in mind, I'm going to rate the conspiracy of the cars from cars being the instigators of a sort of mass human extinction three kachows out of five. But what do you think? Do you think that the motor vehicles from cars would be able to exterminate all of the humans on the planet, leading to them being the dominant species? Have you seen the trailers for Cars 3? And regardless of what you thought of Cars 1 or 2, do you think you might see it? Because I think I'm gonna have to based on what I've seen so far. Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and also if you have any conspiracy ideas you'd like us to take a look at, make sure to send them our way. Until then, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to Channel Frederator, and don't forget to click that little bell icon next to the subscribe button to become part of our notification squad so you can know right away when our next video is uploaded. And remember, Frederator loves you.